Okay, welcome everyone to our speaker series for the Economic Statistics University Transfer Program here at Camosun College. I'm sure that we're going to have a lot of people still joining in over the next five minutes. That's usually the way that it goes. 10.30 start time means uh, somewhere between 10.30 and 10.35, right? So what I'm uh, happy to do is introduce Curtis here for us, who is here to talk about our labor markets. Uh, Curtis will... Uh, be free to start off right away here, but I do want to get through, just for those of you present already, some basic housekeeping. So as we go through, Curtis has said, hey, if you have questions that pop up, if things are like, hey, what's going on as we move through, feel free to post those questions in the chat. And uh, he's okay being interrupted in that way, and we can kind of work those questions in as we work through. Uh, that being said, we will still try to keep at the end, or if there's a place that works and Curtis wants to open it up to it. We will open up near the end a time that we can have a little face-to-face -face chat if people are comfortable turning on their cameras, unmuting themselves, and actually asking some questions in that, uh, in that fashion. So it looks like we have yeah, about 15, I guess there's two of us moderators now, so about 14 of us in right now, but uh, expect probably a few more to be keep trickling in. So uh, Curtis, I'll... Hand it off to you if you want to get started right now, or if you want to give it a few more minutes, uh, feel free as well. Whatever whatever you want, the reins are yours. Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here to chat about um, some of the trends and this crazy um, year and a bit that we've had and what that means going in the future. Um, we can wait a couple minutes as people trickle in because if they're like me, um, they're gonna be here like in about four minutes and uh, barely by the skin of their teeth. So we can we can give it a couple minutes. And I was wondering, Keith, if you did you maybe want to throw that survey that we had chatted about on, and we do that for the next couple minutes, because I would love to get to know sort of what disciplines um, all of you are in. Um, that would help me out. There we Thanks. go. So that should be popped up there now. Let's uh, let's hear where you guys are all in, all enrolled in. Mm -hmm. So for anybody who did just join in there, there is a active poll going on there. If you click your view poll on the bottom, I noticed there's about two people who joined in after after we started that poll. In fact, this is going to be going to be a fun experiment. Uh, if you joined after I started the poll, I'm not even sure if uh, if you'll have access to it. So uh, I'm I'm, I'm yeah. hoping you do, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, no worries. Okay, we got a lot of accounting and finance. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, we might have hit our. Uh, what do you, I can show. Get rid of the poll here. Gotcha. So, account and finance. We've got a bit of everything, but account and financing, marketing, human resources, and one BA. Uh, BA. All right. Cool. Cool. I will close the poll. I think because I think we've got what we were looking for. So I'm going to do that right now. And why don't I just uh, begin? Yeah. For sure. Okay, so my name is Curtis Hogan, um, and I work for CLAC, which is a union um, here in BC and across Canada. Um, my role is a provincial representative, so basically I negotiate contracts and look after um, what are called bargaining units, which would be um, workplaces that are represented by a union and have a collective agreement. So uh, you should have some familiarity with that as um, uh, business students and some of your HR specific people will know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm on the other side of the table. I'm representing the workers uh, and the collective um, uh, when we get down to the bargaining table to negotiate uh, terms of employment. So that's my bread and butter. That's what I do. And so um, today we are going to be talking about uh, sort of the COVID-19 pandemic and what it has meant for the labor force and what it means going forward. It's a pretty big topic. So we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit. Um, and what I'm going to do actually uh, is provide a PowerPoint presentation to go with this because if I don't have that, I would be lost. So we're going to do that, share application screen, screen two, we're going to share that. There we go. I think you guys should all see that. Yep, showing up for me at least. Okay, very good. Okay, so yeah, basically, and I want to pay special attention to uh, what I would be thinking about if I was sitting in your seat. Um, what does this pandemic mean for me when I'm done school? What is it going to mean when I am in the, the labor market? 
uh, what is it going to mean for me and the job I envisioned I have? Is that going to be the same job? And in what ways will it change? And in what ways are jobs changing? Because they are changing um, due to COVID-19 and more specifically, um, the shutdowns that have come out from it. So without further ado, let's kind of get into it. Um, there we go. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of what CLAC is. So like I mentioned, we're a union. Um, it stands for Christian Labor Association of Canada. It was founded as a, a some religious people founded this in Ontario in the 50s, and it's sort of formed into a very inclusive uh, multi-sector national union uh, where we have over 60,000 members across Canada, and we've got about 11, 12,000 BC. Um, you might see a lot of our members working in your areas, uh, lead core construction, um, PCL. Um, if you've ever been to a Canucks game, um, all of the staff who are, um, you know, working the concessions, who are doing the setup and tear down, who are there in security, um, all like about 2,000 people um, working for Canucks Sports Entertainment. That's CLAC members. And in Alberta, uh, you might recognize our workers for Save on Foods. Every Save on Foods grocery store is represented by CLAC. So we have um we have like kind of a wide net uh when it comes to being a multi-sector union which is different than what you see typically uh in in unionism which is very specific to trades uh, we have all trades and all disciplines and we find that it works very well in this um you know global economy where we want to see uh employers um and employees have more flexibility in terms of um, their collective bargaining rights we have offices in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. We're not in Quebec because uh, it's all run by the mob, and I'd probably be wearing cement shoes in the bottom of the St. Lawrence if that was the case. Um, so, yeah, we're also affiliated internationally with the World Organization of Workers, which is just a larger body that kind of provides um, uh, some oversight, I suppose, but also um, connection and networking um, within the global union environment. So that's, that's that. Uh, let's move on. Um, but first, I, listen. When I'm in a Zoom meeting, I'm I'm just well, I'm just looking at my phone with memes. So I thought, let's just cut out the middleman here. Um, we're gonna get a few memes out of the way so that we can um, be on the same page. I like this one. And then, you know, we're talking about the pandemic, so I thought this was pretty funny as well. It sucks that I can't see any laughter. These could be totally bombing. I don't know. Uh, okay, there we go. Thanks, Audrey. Appreciate it. <laughs> Oh, good, good, good. Validating me, validating my existence right now. Okay, let's get through. Okay, so let's get some context. Um, we, <laughs> everything fell off the off the cliff in uh, in the spring or March of 2020. Uh, but it's there's been a lead up to this um, to this point in time. And so we had uh, uh, when I was probably your age uh, back in 2008, I was getting out of school. And that was a horrible, horrible time to be graduating university. Um, I was a journalism student and uh, I was working in the newspaper business uh, at that point. And it was not a fun time where advertisers were slashing dollars and cents due to the uh, recession in a way. So I feel your pain if the, for those of you who are set to graduate soon. Um, we had economic growth in the 2010 and 11, and then we had some oil declines, which in Western Canada, especially Alberta, was, was brutal. Um, I can say specifically within the CLAC world, we really got our in into Western Canada through the oil sands construction. We have um, probably 25,000 members in Alberta, the majority, like vast majority of which are in the construction industry. Um, we are... We represent over 50% of the unionized oil sands construction craft in Fort McMurray. So that's a fairly sizable number and it's only growing as we continue to pick up maintenance contracts um, with them. So that oil decline in 2014, 15, 16 until basically now as we see an uptick was uh, interesting economic uh, times. And then, you know, we slowly recovered and then all of a sudden we have a pandemic. <laughs> as you can see in 2020, all of a sudden everything just goes to crap. Um, interestingly, we, yeah, we see just sort of the, uh, again, some context in 2016 to 2021, uh, or 2020 first quarter, uh, just how, how, how significant, and these are, these are large scale trends, right? These aren't, uh, necessarily sector specific, but in this case, with this graph, we're talking about like small business, medium sized, large, and everyone took a hit, especially the medium sized operations. 
Um, and so that's just context for what we're going to be talking about uh, in terms of just how severe the, um, I, I like this stat when it talks about hours worked. Hours worked is a really good indication, um, in my opinion. Uh, we deal in hours worked in terms of our growth uh, because a job is is kind of not totally telling when it's talking about an unemployment rate. Um, are they working full time? Are they working part time? Are they coming in and out of the labor force? Right? Um, how many hours did they get this year? And so I find that that is a better indicator of when things are healthy. Um, and so I, I like this. And this is just Stats Canada stuff, which you can you can look up. So let's talk about the shutdowns that happened in the pandemic. And again, I'm going through this stuff um, just as a bit of a to get us onto. Uh, the same page as I discussed later on, I'm going to be talking about um, sort of CLACs um, uh, dealing with the pandemic, what it meant for our members, what I saw uh, a bit anecdotally in terms of uh, my members and what what their lives looked like and how different they were uh, after these shutdowns and the pandemic hit. Um, this is a really interesting uh, graph because it's talking about how different sectors were hit and I want you to hold on to this image as we look at you know uh, construction manufacturing retail um, accommodation and food so hotels and restaurants just massively hit and I think that we can connect the dots between why those sectors were hit specifically harder than others um, you know due to the shutdown obviously but there's a little more to the story too uh, in terms of in terms of why um, and so, yeah, like, look at that, that crazy and food services, just so many people. My sister is a university student in Calgary. Um, she has been waitressing uh, her way through university for years and she was on CERB, she was laid off. And I'm sure many people were also um, uh, affected by that here. I know that, um, you know, a lot of university students are in the accommodation and food service industry to pay their way through school. Um, so I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Uh, here's just some basic overview as well, like two and a half million people unemployed, which is astounding. That's incredible of uh, the magnitude of that. Um, we recovered at one in 1.7 million, but I want to also have us pay attention to what recovery actually means. Now, getting back to where we were in February of 2020 is not exactly recovery in the truest sense. Um, they talk about a K-shaped recovery, right, where we sort of come down and then we come up. But it also means, you know, what trends were we seeing in January of 2020? And we're gonna take a look at that in a second. Um, we had, uh, you know, 300,000 unemployed workers left uh, the labor force. Um, uh, men and women have recovered roughly the same, but women saw a massive decline. Um, and we're gonna get to that as well um, in terms of why that was. Well, and it was because we have, uh, someone's got to do childcare, and I found myself doing childcare. My wife as well. Um, it, the social structures that we have right now that we rely on were kind of upended, and it made for very, very murky waters. Um, young people, young workers, uh, it still remains low, really low, in terms of the uh, aftermath of what the last year and a bit has been. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we had you know uh, people of color, indigenous people, uh, have been uh, disproportionately affected by the economic impacts of the pandemic. And those are all, you gotta ask yourself, why is that the case? And, and we're gonna get to that because there's, there's underpinnings within our work life and within the workscape of Canada that are coming to, coming to reckoning right now. And, uh, and we're seeing that throughout. And one of the main reasons is because we have a divide that has taken place and that's between the hourly and the salary employees that work in Canada's labor force. Now you mostly in your field of study here will likely be in the salary side of things. And that's really good news because um, you can't work from home or work remotely if your job is hourly for the most part. We see hourly employment as things like construction, retail, as we saw on that last slide. Um, we see that in terms of uh, uh, healthcare, um, well, though that was not so, that was, we saw growth in healthcare because obviously the nature of, of the pandemic. Um, but yeah, if we take a look at um, how badly hit hourly employees who just simply cannot work remotely, they must be at work. 
uh, how the shutdown affected them. And I mean, we saw dips in the salary employees, um, but by and large, most people on average uh, who work, um, you know, at a desk or can work from home were more or less unaffected. And I just wanted to bring it back to the slide, right? Now let's take a look. Healthcare, so, so you can do that remotely. Education, we've done that remotely. Obviously, uh, university students and your professors have been able to successfully, more or less, um, you know, provide that service. Professional, they've been fine. Finance, there you go. Lots of finance students here, mostly fine. Um, but man, like I said, you can't work remotely if you're a waitress and you can't work remotely if you're in a, a custodian or uh, anything like that. Um, in transportation, you can't work remotely if you're operating a semi truck, um, driving uh, needed commodities across uh, the country via the highway. You can't do it. Need you in the workplace, in person. Uh, and those are the ones who, of course, are most negatively impacted in terms of uh, the numbers of people who are out of work. And then I just, you know, working from home makes me think of this. I love uh, Big Mike. TLC. Watch a lot of TV. Who here has watched a lot of TV? I should do that poll. Who's watched more TV than, than they have in their entire life over the last year? Because uh, I definitely have uh, living in the north. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and this is probably all of you, hey, right now? Uh, if you guys have your cameras off. <laughs> I never turn my camera on either when I'm in the audience because I'm in my pajamas. <laughs> Melissa, that's funny. Oh, right, Sandra, of course, you've been busy studying, yeah. No, you've got the keener in your class, as you, as we can see. <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of employment here, um, this is just a, a quick little hit. We're not gonna spend too much time. This is just showing what 2019 looked like. Pretty steady, pretty steady, some growth, but a pretty stagnant year. Um, and then if we compare that, this is the employment in Canada in 2020, we see that massive dip. And then they talk about that K-shaped, right? That K-shaped recovery. And, and yeah, we're, we're there. But as I mentioned before, um, recovery is misleading to a degree because where would we be in 2020 without the pandemic? Would we have seen growth? I think we would have. There's been growth projected. So have we hit our natural growth state? Um, no, we haven't. We're just barely getting back to a place where we were. So we've got a lot of ground to cover to kind of see a true recovery happen. And this is just my world, right? And I'm going to circle it back to that because I'm not a macroeconomics professor. I'm not, uh, I'm, you know, I've got knowledge and intricate knowledge of, of the labor relations scene. In our, in our unionized environment and what we have seen with, and we have our data. And so I thought, you know, this is pretty proprietary stuff, but let's take a look at, you know, maybe how, how a labor union was affected. Um, this is a, you know, we really followed um, pretty closely with the trend lines. Um, our union employees uh, outside of the public sector are typically hourly employees. And we, um, as a union, you know, I was mentioning we have 60,000 members across Canada. Almost all of them are, um, are uh, hourly employees making an hourly wage. Um, and so, yeah, the pandemic has been brutal, um, but um, that being said, we are in healthcare, so things evened out, right? We had a lot more healthcare workers and a lot less construction workers, so, but yeah, it followed the trend pretty pretty closely. But what about BC, because that's where we're living, right? How are we doing? Well, we made a bit better recovery than Canada as a whole. We're, we're in a bit better position. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're roughly exactly where we were. Um, at this point, and uh, and that's interesting. We got some January data too, which most of the data ended up um, finding itself end in August. But I was trying to find some stuff that's more into 2021, and we were able to track some of this stuff down. And this is fresh data from our union side of things. Um, yeah, and then here we go. Here's you know all the stuff together, and uh, yeah, take that for what it's worth. It's like I mean we we're definitely behind. Um, we're definitely behind where the rest of the province is, and that's because we don't have the nice salary jobs that can work remotely um, as a union. Construction, and I only bring this up because construction is kind of uh, is a huge industry in BC right now, and is going to be a good indicator for economic growth and recovery going forward uh, in terms of um, getting resources to market. Um, and as we see here, 
um, yeah, uh, we saw big dips and, but also you look at with us, we, we got really busy during the pandemic. Yeah, no, absolutely. Travel and tourism, we actually, right next to my office here, we have, uh, and Sanders uh, pointed out that, you know, uh, tourism um, and some of those uh, industries, which are really important to BC, have not recovered. Um, you could probably argue that some of those industries were declining as it was based on the ease at which we can book our flights and plan our trips. Uh, but yeah, like, uh, but actual people vacationing and coming in, uh, it's been it's been tough. We have a travel agency right next door, and they haven't been in the office in a year and a half. So I don't know if they've shut their doors or they're just maybe went into early retirement. I'm not sure where they're at. Um, but it's interesting here with construction, as you can see, um, had a. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, Melissa, good point. So Melissa's saying, yeah, there's a bit of an inverse in construction. And so BC is uniquely positioned right now. We have a lot of um, of important mega projects that just have to go. And uh, one example, and we're gonna get to it a bit, we're gonna do a case study uh, coming up on, on how this was uh, for Site C because CLAC, and actually me specifically, uh, I look after the Site C dam construction for uh, the main civil works portion, which has, uh, between 1,000 and 1,500 workers at any given point. Um, uh, and uh, and this was a really interesting year. Very interesting because he ha they had to work. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We could not stop that work. We were diverting a river. So you got to get it done. So some of our numbers, because of the heavy amount of Site C work that we had, are going to show that spike up uh, and decline naturally uh, into the winter, which is a seasonal decline for us, usually in heavy construction. So um, those uh, that that kind of shows why we have a bit of a, a difference there. But you know the numbers only tell you so much, right? Um, the workplace has been very changed, and yeah, numbers of employees, yeah, that's great. But what does it actually mean meaning for the people who are working? Um, I can tell you from my experience that I've seen a lot of psychological um, tension over the last year and a half, and especially uh the shutdowns and uh during the wake of the pandemic because you know i believe that we still have fear of covid but if we can rewind our brains back to march and april that was a very very scary time and if you had to weigh the options of going to work and providing you know uh, income for your mortgage so you have a, to your family you know and all that kind of stuff and your health and safety well all of a sudden you're at attention where you kind of just want to be home and hibernate and you know until this thing's over but you know for most workers they had to go to work and that puts strain on the aspects of health and safety and i can tell you right now the uncertainty just the fact that you don't know what's going to happen day to day is super stressful for most employees it's um there's going to be studies that are going to come out that talk about all of this and the effects of it um, right now the data is a little sparse because we're in it um, but I can tell you anecdotally that a lot of my phone calls and dealing with my members during the pandemic were simply about the future. What is going to happen? And I don't have a crystal ball, but more or less, most people just wanted to talk and be able to have something bounce off someone else. Um, the family impact has been nuts. Uh, you know, we've had uh, schools shut down. That was so, so devastating for uh, for families because that is a and we're going to talk about this, but it's it's a sort of a it's a crack in our in our country's social socioeconomic sort of uh, fabric. School is childcare, and without school, you don't have childcare. And it became the decision, you know, of going to work or staying home and doing the online education for people, and that was so so stressful. Um, those decisions that you had to make. Um, you're working from home, yeah, it was a novel concept at the beginning, but you know, fast forward to now, and it's it's just it's sort of tedious. Um, there's a lot of mental health and emotional impacts that have come along with the last year and a half, and you're seeing that in the workplace. Um, and then community impact, like you know, people have clubs and and activities and and connections, and they're involved in their communities, and that stuff has also been made more difficult. So it's just what it's done is it's just created this level of heaviness and that per permeates the workplace as well. And you can't escape it. In my line of work, it's there. It's on both sides, union and management. Everyone is feeling it. 
This is an interesting stat, and I think this is kind of mostly what I was talking about before a little bit. Um, we have provinces that have um, uh, uh, investment in childcare. So as you can kind of see, like a, a country, or a country, well, it is kind of its own country, a province like Quebec, where they do, they, they invest quite a lot of money into childcare. Um, and then what we see is we see more women participate in the, in the labor force based on the correlation with childcare funding. Now, you know, that is, to me is pretty telling. Uh, we need women in the, in the labor force and that decision should not have to be made that, you know, just because people decide to have a family, it means you have to, you know, stop working or jeopardize your career. But right now, just because also in BC, I mean, my goodness, and I don't know how many parents are in this audience, but the, the price of childcare is just astronomical. It really is like most of your income, um, depending on your uh, income bracket that you have to uh, sacrifice. And so I thought this was an interesting interesting graph to show, um, you know, when the public investment in childcare is there, so is the participation in the labor force. It seems no brainer to me, but again, our, some, you know, we need to do a better job lobbying our government to, uh, to, to share the burden. Why is Quebec higher than the rest of Canada? Well, they're like, I, you know, I kind of, I kind of misspoke there about Quebec being um, its own country. They are run so very different and culturally very different that you do find a lot more European style um, governance. And if you look at your Europe, you will find that those rates of um, public investment into childcare are very high, especially in France and Northern Europe and stuff like that. Um, so I think it's just simply they beat their own drum or walk, march to the beat of their own drum. Yeah. And I think that's mostly why. And they can get away with it because, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, Keith. Thanks. So where are we at right now? Oh, man, man, I'm slow. OK, so let's do a case study. So I looked after this is the Sightsee Dam, and I know it's a very political issue, and I know that people probably have many opinions on it. But hey, I didn't build I didn't decide to build a dam. I'm just representing the workers who need to work safely and work for good wages and, and all those other things who are going to complete it. So, you know, my job there is to make sure that those, the bargaining unit, that is um, the, the employees for Peace River Hydro Partners who are party to a CLAC collective agreement are taken care of, okay? So I'm gonna give you a look, this is, this is kind of the timeline of how things were. This is a case study. And this is, you're, you're the very first group of people who have any of this information in terms of this has not been shared with the media. This is, this is very much an inside baseball uh, perspective on what it was like to be a uh, essential construction worker during the pandemic. And at first, uh, in my world, I had phone calls off the hook. I was basically chain smoking cell phone conversations, one to the other, for about a month straight, 16, 17 hour days, just trying to allay the fears of people who were w freaking out because one, we didn't have the proper health and safety measures on in the actual work site uh, to accommodate um, uh, um, uh, an outbreak. Um, so that meant hand sanitizing, that we were short on bleach wipes, we were short on everything, because remember, Back in the spring, I don't know how many people here, and you can probably let me know, but how many people were, were wiping down their groceries after, uh, after going to the grocery store? Um, that was where we were at, and so there was naturally a fear of contamination, of all that kind of health and safety stuff, and so people were saying, I'm not gonna work, we're not, and it's not, that's not job action, that's simply everyone's right uh, within the WorkSafe code, which is uh, a government regulation, uh, in BC, to if you are if you're being put in a position to work unsafely, you have the right to refuse it, and you can't be disciplined for that. And so we were saying essentially we can't work safely until we know we have sanitation stations, we have hand wash stations, and we have um, proper PPE, right, per personal protective equipment like gloves and masks to be able to do the work safely. So on top of that, at that point in time, there was airports being shut down from Newfoundland, Halifax. Uh, I quarantine isolations and stuff like that. And so people are going and saying, if I go home, because again, this dam is, um, it's a, it's shift work. You come in for 14 days and you go home for seven. If I go home, am I, am I going to be able to come back? Or if I stay more importantly, am I going to be able to go home? Because what happens if things get shut down? We at work, I'm going to be stuck in a work camp for who knows how long. And these are all things that were happening at the forefront. They were fear of an outbreak in the camp, right? What happens if we get a COVID outbreak in the camp? We're all stuck together. Um, and then there were a lot of requests for people to say, listen, I can't deal with this right now. My family is in turmoil. We're feeling very anxious and afraid. I need to go home. And so we were able to make sure that 
um, employees who requested a layoff were given a layoff temporarily and could be brought back at a later date. But then the question became, we have a dam to build and we must meet these milestones. We have to divert the Peace River and into a, these tunnels that were built and um, to divert it while we build the infrastructure of the dam core. And uh, what we had to end up doing at that point, negotiate terms for a long shift, meaning we were gonna have people come in and work for several weeks at a time. And so it ended up being about an eight to 12 week shift where people just stayed at camp and worked straight. And that was stressful, don't get me wrong. Um, but at that point in time, an outbreak could have derailed that project. And we needed to work safely and we needed to work um, to deadline. And so we were able to also negotiate and we were the only ones I believe in the entire, as far as I know in BC, our construction workforce were the only to get time and a half overtime for every hour they worked to make sure that happened. Um, pretty good, pretty good deal. And um, and lo and behold, with that, they were able to meet their milestones. But that being said, it's give and take. Um, you make good money and you're safe. You know, not going back and forth between cities and stuff like that. But they shut down the theaters and the camp because this is a pretty world class camp. We've got wonderful gyms. Uh, we've got theaters. We've got game rooms. We've got all kinds of stuff all shut down um, because we can't have it is a great incentive for the workers normally um, well yeah in the wages for sure but when that stuff was shut down you're pretty lonely and if you're doing 12 weeks of work and all you do is go to work and you go back to your camp and you eat your food <laughs> Alex sounds better than where I live it's not bad <laughs> yeah yeah um, and so what we found at that point in time where people were starting to say hey I want to come back to work okay so there, there was a bit of a price point on people's fears at that point it seemed and then, you know, as we got into 2020, things just started to normalize. Um, you know, we, we had a lot of good health and safety protocols. We did have our first COVID cases, but by that point in time, they seemed, there was a little less anxiety over it because we were finding that, you know, as long as we were doing our proper contract tracing and as long as there weren't any outbreaks, things were relatively okay. And I'll tell you something, uh, and this again is a little inside baseball, but um, we had, um, we have had very few cases at Site C. And I can't, you don't quote me on the number, but I, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we've seen maybe, you know, 20, maybe 30 cases over the last year and a half. And put that into context, there's 4,500 workers on this site and project. So if you want to talk about provincial averages, that's extremely low. Um, and that was a big fear. Um, it was a big fear that these camps would end up having massive outbreaks and it would be pandemonium. But it was, in fact, it was the opposite. It, it protected workers because of the health and safety measures that existed at the camps. And then where are we right now? It's just business as usual. Uh, oh, ba ba Basil, Basil, uh, Kennedy, yes, we're similar. I want to read your comment there. So let me just take a look. Oh, how do I get to the chat? Oh, there it is. Similar. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're somewhere in the middle um, between, you know, the U.S. and Europe. Yeah, we're, I would say we're somewhere in the middle of all of that. We've been with the liberal government. We've been a little more on that socially, I'll say, uh, economically conscious <laughs> side of things, for sure. Yeah, 100%, Melissa. So um, I think that camps like that can be a prison or a, or a castle. And I, I, I thought that at the very beginning, and they ended up being a castle. And, and what I mean by that is they protected people. Um, camps are largely um, set up for um, outbreaks of GI, like gastrointestinal, you know, stuff like that, the flu. So there's all kinds of protocols that they already have to mitigate that kind of spread. So they were, there had been a GI that had gone through in January. And so they were already in a, in a, in a uh, pandemic type protocol at the time that COVID started. So what that meant was we weren't, um, they weren't touching their coffee cups. They weren't touching their lunch bags. They were literally having things tended to them. They would go to work, they'd come back, they'd get their food given to them, and they'd go to their room. And so if you think about all our interactions at home, they were having way less interactions at Site C. Anyway, um, that is kind of a case study there with PRHP. And there's another case, so you know, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> no worries. It's Curtis, by the way, but I'll let it slide. Um, uh, another, uh, case study here, Canuck Sports Entertainment. So this is a, another sector uh, where we have a couple thousand people working in that industry. And this is a very different tale, okay? March of 2020, events are canceled. We have shutdowns. We can't have gatherings of more than 50 people. Uh, and there's just mass layoffs, mass layoffs. Um, um, and I would say this is probably the hardest hit bargaining unit that we have in our union. 
oh, <laughs> I like how I left in this um, template thing. Oops. Uh, um, you know, in 2020, they've got some skeleton crews who are maintaining, when I say skeleton crews, I mean like they have a contingent of people that are working who have to just kind of keep the lights on, right? That's a very big complex and there's a lot of work that needs to be done just to maintain its um, structure and make sure that everything is, you know, working properly. Um, but uh, most of our employees there are collecting CERB. And uh, right now we're just saying, listen, the vaccine, it cannot come fast enough. That industry, events, I think there was a mention, um, <laughs> no problem, uh, there was a mention of, uh, of uh, tourism and other industries, very similar. If you can't bring the people in, you can't work. The job is completely, um, is completely dependent on large gatherings. So like, what a, what a night and day, hey? Whereas in one case, I would argue that some of our construction workers made more this year in income than they did in years past and others were decimated and laid off. What an interesting time, right? And it's so sad to see layoffs, but it's so out of our control. So what's next? I love this New Yorker cartoons, gotta love them. <laughs> you know, where are we gonna be back on track? We need to come back to where we were. I hope so. A little bit of a history lesson. So, you know, back in the 30s with the Great Depression, um, we saw mass unemployment. We saw um, like sent like uh, in, in hundreds of years, we haven't seen anything like that in terms of how that devastated um, the economy, it devastated the workforce, families, everything. Um, and but there are things that always come out of depressions or world events or um, when, and I would argue, when the cracks in the foundation of our workforce and safety nets are exposed. And that's what we're seeing now. Um, uh, yeah, oh, Melissa, yeah, there are, sorry, I didn't see your uh, question. Yeah, there are more people now. It's starting to uptick slowly, but again, we don't have fans, so we don't have concessions and stuff like that as much. So it's still probably 75% of our employees there are not working. Um, yeah, I was saying the uh, it, it, we have these cracks that become exposed, and so in the Great Depression, we had you know things come out, and uh, like the CDC was created out of the Great Depression to provide news and all that kind of stuff, and then the Bank of Canada to control interest rates and control um, the our uh, our um, general economic foundation. Um, in the 40s, we ended up having employment insurance introduced, which would have been a byproduct of the Great Depression. And you know, in America, Social Security came about and, and other large public infrastructure projects that just basically made work for people like the Hoover Dam being built here um, in uh, uh, Nevada. Uh, and it's a pretty impressive thing if you ever see it. Um, and that was built basically with government money saying, we're just gonna put people to work. And you start to see government projects after that, like that became a norm. You know, this was, it was pretty unprecedented, to be honest, at that time, something like the Hoover Dam. And in Canada, we have some of these public infrastructure projects, which are large, and um, they're done with joint ventures with our private contractors, of course, but the idea um, that, uh, that we would have that kind of government money, right, um, is pretty fascinating. Um, and so all I mean to say that is, you know, we're going to see something come out of the pandemic that um, will be because of what we're finding the people falling through the cracks, right? Um, health, social, economic crisis has exposed the gaps. It's pressuring companies to improve working conditions, right? Uh, and I think these employees, they all stick around. And I'm just in, in terms of the immediate term, as I kind of jump around here, I do believe we're going to see a big boom in BC imminently uh, in construction. Um, our LNG project, our, our, our province's LNG, the largest private infrastructure project uh, in BC's history, uh, in LNGC, in, in Kitimat, BC, is uh, is not even really, didn't really even get a chance to start it to its capacity. So we're going to see um, thousands and thousands of workers at that facility. Yeah, Keith, massive. And it's going to get our natural gas, which is the cleanest combustible that we have. It basically burns neutral um, to, to, to heat the um, uh, homes in countries like Malaysia and Japan and Asia uh, who de desperately need it to stop burning um, diesel and other fuels um, as we kind of get our um, uh, our carbon imprint um, lowered. Um, Site C is continuing on. We got another five, five, six, seven years of this project. Um, tr Trans Mountain Pipeline, uh, Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, uh, there are thousands and thousands of workers. So we're seeing, that, and those things have just been like, like a, it's like a horse chopping at the bit. We've got a floodgate of work that needs to get done and was supposed to be done in 2020. 
So we're going to see a flood in BC. So it's going to be kind of like as we saw that other graph, like we're going to see that peak. Maybe when things are dipping, we're going to see some of that. Um, we need to switch to hemp. Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> we're going to see some, uh, some increases here in BC's economy. Now, what does this mean for us, right? And again, I think, am I going over time here, Keith? Where are we at? Are we wrapping up? I'm almost done, I think. Yeah, a couple slides to go. Oh, yeah, we're, we're uh, good. We're good. Okay. Um, in the future, this is going to mean, um, like, I'll tell you my experience. You know, I never really worked from home before this. The expectation was that you go to work, go to the office, you show up, you do your thing, and then you go home. And it's shown that flexibility is actually a really good thing uh, in the workplace. We're finding now, and as more and more news stories come out, that those workers, and there were some, there were some companies uh, at the beginning of the pandemic that immediately just said, we're going to fully go to remote working. And we're seeing that it's not actually that great for the workers to have without having that kind of hub, that connection and community to your workplace. We're finding there's some detrimental effects to being fully remote, um, but some mixture and flexibility of that is having um, is going to stick around for sure. And we would never have had this um, uh, in short term or medium term without pandemic. Um, it can also affect where people choose to live. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, there's talk um, of having a, a rural boom, right? If you don't need to be in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, wherever, Toronto, then you can kind of live wherever you want. And then it, why would I spend, you know, a million dollars on a house in Vancouver, or that'd be cheap house, I guess, uh, when I could when I could live uh, in the interior or I could live on the island, you know, for less and I could work remotely and not have to have that kind of debt obligation, right? Those things become way more in the picture. Um, and uh, yeah, well, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why they've been booming for sure. Well, I'll tell you what, Fort St. John, you can go live up here. It's just as beautiful. I can almost guarantee it. Uh, just don't Google it. You don't need to. Um, uh, and then we have more traction for things like uh, big income uh, and like child child credits. Dawson Creek, Alex, there you go. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. Um, oh, so Audrey, okay, that's a good question. So oh, born and raised, well, I'm from Peace River, Alex, so we're basically cousins. Um, Audrey asked, do you think that uh, the communities have become lazier with the pandemic? Do you think we will all bounce back into our old ways before COVID, or will we keep working in a digital world when possible? No, I think we're going to be working in a digital world. I do, um, to a degree. And I think that it's so difficult at this point to find an answer for that first question. Like, are we lazy, are we this, are we that? Some days, and I think that I might, um, oh, Allison, also in Dawson, whoa, we've got some peace country connections. Some days, and I, I wonder if you guys are the same, where you're just like, man, I suck. This is, oh, man, I used to be able to just get all this stuff done, and I mean, I'm at home, I've got all this time, I've got all this opportunity, and I just can't seem to get anything done. I can't seem to get any traction, and I'm gonna tell you something. You have a little self-compassion because um, everyone's in the same boat. It's extremely difficult for everybody. And I think that lazy would be a term I would use. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that we're being under, an, we're, uh, we're being put under an incredible amount of stress, as I kind of indicated earlier, in terms of what I was doing with our union members. Yeah, we can just go to Q&A time. Like, I've only got, uh, oh, I was going to say one thing. Yeah, uh, I'll touch on this. Uh, there's there's been talk, you know, I thought maybe for you all, post-secondary disruption. Um, well, there's been a lot of investment in um, global v virtual reality education. Um, companies like Google have required, like, they're dropping their requirements for a four-year degree rather than, you know, and so there's more specialized educational requirements that can be done online and remotely. Um, it's going to be interesting for the workforce coming up. Um, it, I wouldn't necessarily say it's great news um, for university students, but if you can roll with it, that I think that you will likely really succeed well because it's going to be a very interesting workforce outlook possibly in the future. And I got a lot of these kind of questions and, and future castings from um, from a site which I, I can't even remember off the top of my head, but it's in my notes at the end. Um, I think the jobs are going to come back um, on BC especially. Um, pandemic has altered our economy, but uh, listen, it's going to require some skill sets that um, that will develop, and those who are early adopters are going to reap the rewards. And again, like I said, we're going to see a construction boom here shortly, and that's going to impact BC in a really positive way in terms of our um, GDP, in terms of our unemployment rate. But you got to find the places that are 
that are going to grow, right? In some of these industries that, you know, like I was talking about, like um, uh, travel agencies, stuff like those are dead and they're not coming back, right? Um, and uh, one thing I would want to touch on right before we go to Q&A, collective bargaining could be key here. Now, I'm a union guy, right? And But I always I wasn't always. I, I, you know, like I mentioned before, I was a journalist before this and I got involved with CLAC who I thought were doing some interesting things. And I was always passionate about um, the world of work. And I'll tell you something, millennials and, and Gen Z and, 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 all, and younger, younger generations, um, we don't really think about a lot about unions, but collective bargaining could really be key in terms of how we have a say in terms of what the work world looks like. Collective bargaining is simply employees coming together and negotiating terms of employment. That's it. And everyone has the right to do that. But we have this idea of unionism as kind of like blue collar, like, you know, going on strike, locking yourself in the plant and, you know, all this kind of negative stuff. But we have all these legislations which allow us to, to dictate the terms of our employment contracts. Um, but you have to have a union or an employee association to do so. So I always think like it's 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 fruit, you know, low hanging fruit uh, to change from old school collective bargaining unionism to a collaborative interest based approach, like similar to what Clack does. Um, we're an independent, fully Canadian union and we don't give any money to super PACs in the States and we aren't international. Um, you know, we, we, we are all Canadian and uh, we like it that way. So and we're interested in finding collaborative ways to move forward in the labor scene, which is not to see the employer as an enemy, but to see them as a partner, right? And believe it or not, members like it too, because the world has changed. There isn't that antagonism like there was 50, 60, 70 years ago, and we got to move with the times. So that being said, um, this is the last one. Let's, we can do Q&A if you want. Uh, I'll make my screen. Uh, I'll stop sharing this. And... Yeah, so, um, I don't know, uh, did I answer all the questions there, Audrey? Did I answer your question, Audrey? I think I might have got sidetracked. In oh, they're all filing in now. Look at all okay, this. Okay, let's see here. <laughs> <laughs> um, for for okay. this question and answer, too, I mean, if you guys are comfortable, I think it would be great if we could get, uh, right again, assuming you guys aren't just in bed wearing your PJs still, but uh, if you're comfortable getting uh, on camera and uh, some actual talking going on here, uh, makes it a bit more personal, right? Uh, we'll get to uh, Noreen and Melissa, but let's get some face-to-face -face ones first. Alec, I see your hands raised there. Let's uh, let's jump to you. Yeah, I noticed that like you're talking about um, the micro, like not un typically university degrees a lot of employers are wanting, but like micro certificates and like mm -hmm. people actually paying employers for interns. And I was just Wanted to hear like your thoughts on that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. So I got um, I got that from uh, the Brookfield Institute, which um, I, I think is fairly credible. There, I think they have an agenda for sure. But they had some interesting um, um, future casting questions, which I was just very interested in. And so they were mentioning that there's there has been an increase in that, and maybe that will continue. Yeah, where experience and more micro education. And again, I'm not an expert on this by any stretch, but I can tell you that in the world and Keith you can probably back me up on this um, there's all kinds of always there's always been opportunities to fine-tune your skill sets and they become they always seem to become available when you're in a career um, you know to kind of yourself slowly but um, having access to those specific skill sets um, in the university uh, age group or in that demographic would be interesting and I think maybe becomes more prevalent but I don't know it was a question that was asked on this study and I thought it was an interesting one and so I put it out there but if you want more information um, it'd be the Brookfield Institute.ca uh, and they have a really interesting future cast uh, um, uh, booklet that they put out um, study yeah I was kind of interested like to see like how like because usually people are doing internships so like don't really have everything set up kind of financially at that point so mm -hmm. it kind of be even like maybe another barrier to entry kind of thing because like it, yeah it could be but i wonder too if it's like if you don't need a degree and i'm not trying to put keith true. out of a job but if you don't need a degree <laughs> in putting your money towards an internship you know like there's there's just it's just all these things are being asked and who knows where it settles but you know um, in lieu of tuition perhaps but i'm not i'm no expert on that it was just a fascinating touch point yeah okay. Uh, Noreen, do you want to touch on uh, your question that you posted there? Just yeah, to see if your camera on. Yeah, yeah. I was just uh, thinking that 
um, the first year, maybe more or less, is going to be very turbulent when organizations, um, uh, not the production uh, firms that are already um, on the production floor, but let's say colleges, universities, government employees, and anyone who was able to operate from their homes, they're fully uh, back to uh, their organizations. I'm expecting some turbulences there. Some may not feel comfortable. Um, I, I am kids co-worker. I teach at the uh, School of Business at Kamasan College. Um, uh, do the unions um, um, put together some strategies to look into these issues and how they're going to handle? There's going to be the fairness issue and so many mm -hmm. things. Who is uh, what does comfortable mean, etc. So, is there any strategy that you guys are looking at? Yeah, I mean, my world is predominantly. Um, not white collar, and I say like not, you know, the members I represent typically aren't um, uh, working remotely or um, working in an office environment or as an educator, professor. Um, but yeah, like in another, in a general sense, for sure, like all these are questions that I deal with every day and strategies to implement. And what we're really talking about when we talk about that is health and safety. That's what we're talking about. At its very core, we're talking about how are we going to create a safety culture? And as we get more and more into the reality that mental health is health, is physical health, then it has become uh, in the arena of our work safe and, and we see more and more legislation and regulation in terms of employers having the obligation to create a mentally and emotionally healthy and safe environment. So that's entirely where unions come in. And it, what it is, it's it's collaborating with the employer to make sure that the voice of its workers are heard and that there's a dialogue going forward. Um, um, and so, yeah, I'm definitely seeing that on my end. And I think that there's always an arena to, to create um, solutions to what we're seeing. It should be at least in every collective bargaining arrangement. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. What else we got here? Um, we have question. Melissa's question in the chat there. I also turned on my camera so that I can participate. Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, hey. um, I was just really curious because when you were showing the chart about how like the growth significantly dipped um, because of the pandemic and then later talking about how like there's major, specifically in BC, there's major construction projects that are kind of going to help the GDP and everything. Do you think that the construction sector is going to help make up for, like that sector alone is going to help make up for the growth that we lost and maybe push us back to the trajectory of our year over year growth? Or do you think it's just going to be like a slight net positive to kind of get us back on track, but we're going to need more sectors no, I, back on that trajectory? Yeah, I would say, I would say as you were, you, you kind of hit it on the head there. I, th I think, and again, I'm not an economist, but I'm, I'm looking at, but in a, in a, there is an economy, there's a union economy, and I'm looking at what I see, where I see membership totals and where I see our members getting to work in, in terms of that, and we do contribute significantly to the BC economy, I would say we're going to see a significant bounce um, with the projects that are going right now. Um, and if you take a look, construction has, was affected pretty significantly early on, but it's largely been fine over the course of the last year. But we have a very, all these political projects, right? And the public health orders are saying, whoa, 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 we, we, can't, um, we can't get 2,000 workers back to work because of these health orders. So it's like, it's like a dam, like no, you know, kind of interesting choice of words considering our case study. But it's, and it's like, it's building up, like this work needs to get done. Um, so yeah, I would say um, absolutely, I think it's going to help stimulate the economy and it could make up as a bit of a windfall uh, in the short term. Um, how much of it, I don't know. Um, but BC is in a good spot, I can tell you, uh, in that area, you know. Yeah, because like I said earlier, especially around me where there's like, I live near Machosan and there's like thousands of housing projects they stopped for maybe a month, maybe two, and then immediately, mm -hmm. like, full crew, nothing, like, it, nothing even happened, just full force. So I was just surprised when you showed the chart that it showed a dip, and I was like, it didn't have a dip here. I wake up every day with blasting. I wish <laughs> Yeah, 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 no doubt. I think large, I think those large-scale construction projects contributes, like, the lion's share of, 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 um, of that, that correction right that were they had to be paused because it's just we didn't know what we we're dealing with right yeah yeah cool good question 
have a big year. VR education. Uh, so let me, uh, do you think it will have an impact on the future economy? Well, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, Keith, I wonder if you want to step in on any of these two because, like, I, I'm interested as we have differences in our educational – if education somehow shifts, then, yeah, perhaps we would see differences economically. I think the gig economy is going to become more and more and more expanded, and, and that's not great news for the workers yes. um, because – and everyone will know what I'm talking about, right, Keith, when I say the gig economy? Yeah, so for those of you who might not be familiar, that's, uh, you know, things like Uber and everything that goes with that, that, hey, you can just get this, you're a contractor, essentially, work in, yeah. the idea being, initially, it's a really good, cool idea, you have your job, and it gives you the ability to earn extra money on the side, the unfortunate byproduct of it is that it's become almost this completely unregulated, um, it's your only source of employment. And then that creates a lot of uh, social and uh, equality issues for sure. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I, I find that um, uh, that it's part and parcel. Like as we maybe see some of these alternate routes of education, then we likely would see alternate methods for employment. And what does that mean? And I think that this is what I'm saying. Like, I, I don't think collective bargaining is the answer for everything by any stretch. But I think that there is – room to grow um, some of these uh, employment uh, bargaining contracts um, to make sure that we are being able to negotiate the terms of our employment. Um, and gig economies, like they have no say. Um, and and yeah, it's a bit of a, we're in uncharted territory. So I personally think like unions are great for millennials. Like I'm one and I thought, well, that's cool. Like you get to basically like negotiate your terms of employment and you have like votes and stuff like that. It sounds really like avocado toast to me, but uh, uh, you know, it, for whatever reason, there's just a disconnect between collective bargaining and, this, and the younger generation. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. Clack is still growing. Um, but again, I'm talking about some of those more um, non, non blue collar um, sectors uh, typically with the advance, and we have some HR students, with the advancing in um, sophisticated HR, um, they do a good job where unions would normally contribute. So, you know, as long as those um, those measures are being upped to make sure that people are taken care of, it's the win-win, right? Um, oh, yeah, Melissa, I'm talking about the Uber. Oh, no, sorry, Hannah first. Uh, BC Fair is uh, super interesting to see how they have dealt with the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, Hannah, that's a good, that's a very good question. Um, it is what, collective bargaining fast. It is not. Um, so it is always a a matter of great importance when you're changing employment terms, and that can that can really take time. And you and it's not like without a union in place, the advantage, of course, is that an employer can make a very quick decision and and roll it out. Um, when you have a union to deal with, oh yeah, it slows things down because you can't just unilaterally change the, the contract. You have to consult and you have to have agreement, in fact, for that. So where does that advantage uh, with BC Ferries? Yeah, I would say it's very common um, to have a bit of conflict and for it to take a bit of time to find that balance of, well, we have to make sure that they agree. You can't just unilaterally change it because you've got a contract. Union contracts are between two parties, right? It's not just the unions, it's the employers too. And so it's no different than the other contract uh, and stakeholders that they would have per, perhaps clients and stuff like that. So um, yeah, but you know what? A good union should be able to move quickly. They should be able to see the value in, like if the business fails, then you don't have any members. So being able to roll with the punches and make the hard decisions quickly and, and be able to um, uh, be fluid where maybe perhaps in the past they have been um, pretty harsh uh, is important. And it's the only way unions are going to survive. And Melissa Pat points out the um, past legislation in California for, for Uber that hurt the workers that that was not good. Um, it definitely did take away some of those, um, uh, some of those employment standards rights. And again, yeah, it's an interesting world we're in right now with the gig economy. Okay, uh, we're going over. So, um, yeah, we're uh, we're ready right at our time, but uh, oh, thanks okay. everyone who's here. Um, I will just in case anyone does want to stick around, any like we'll take a final question if there's somebody who's itching or it's like, oh no, I didn't get it in. Is there anyone just right right there? 
yeah. And also, if you guys have any questions or anything like that, or want to touch base with me, you can just hit me up my email right there, and uh, I'd be happy to um, to chat further or uh, answer any questions. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. So, Sandra, I can I can talk a little bit to that. I don't know if there's anything specifically about right now with this pandemic, but in many previous studies, it has been shown that uh, individuals, cohorts that graduate in the midst of economic downturns, their uh, lifelong earnings are actually negatively affected. And that's uh, that seems to be a relatively true phenomenon that we witnessed through many recessions through the past. Um, we witnessed that again in the 08, 09. We witnessed that again in uh, 2014 with the oil price downturn. Um, yeah, graduating in a recession is never a great idea. I mean, not one of those things you necessarily have control over either, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely find that has negative impacts. And again, that's talking about on average. There's always exceptions, right? When you're talking about statistics, there's always the extreme cases that go outside of that, but typically speaking, yeah, not not great. Yeah. It's a good time to go to school. <laughs> it is. It is. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. And and it's actually oh. um, I I don't know. I'm not on the administration or the registration side, so I can't speak a ton to it. But from what I've been listening to and seeing, just because hey, it's my uh, it's my field, and uh, I've been interested in it. Is that there's a lot of uh, chat about how do registration, how does the registrar actually weigh your grades given this year for these new high school graduates who are coming in? Um, what does it mean that you have this grade in math, this grade in English, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Uh, so I know there's a lot of discussion as to how exactly that uh, that that is looked at, and that actually just builds upon uh, several years of discussion. I don't know if there is a, almost a scandal about it um, because there were certain universities that were waiting grades from certain uh, high schools hmm. saying, hey, this high school tended to inflate their grades. I think it was a private school tended to inflate their <laughs> grades. And so universities caught on to it and they just started to discount the grades that their graduates had. So right, it's all part of a bigger discussion for sure. <laughs> Weird yeah. times, hey? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Where was this exactly? Where was this when I was in high school? I don't think I'd like very much to go to, to have to do online school and all that kind of stuff in high school. That would have been pretty tough, I think. Oh, I, I, th I think it's hard for, uh, I think it's hard for everybody. I mean, even uh, majority of the students here, it's it's not an enviable situation. Teaching mm -hmm. it, teaching it's another battle altogether. I mean, uh, that's that's a true point there, Alec. I, I can't wait to get back to the classroom either. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we've used up lots of Curtis's time here. Uh, again, Curtis, thank you so much for joining us and your presentation. It was uh, very enlightening, very, very insightful, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining in and all your questions that you had. Um, yeah, I'll be sticking around for a little bit if anybody has any last questions for me or anything that you want to work through. Um, I'm not sure if Curtis will be sticking around or if he wants to take off. He is free to. I'm done with him. Um, I'm yeah. sure he has a busy day ahead of him. But uh, again, thank you to everyone. Yeah, and thank you all. This is a great opportunity to just kind of talk about things um, uh, in my world, which I don't always get to do. And like I mentioned, uh, my email's up on the chat there. Um, don't be afraid to reach out if anything comes to you or you want to um, connect on a question or anything like that. Um, always happy to connect. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much, Curtis. Okay. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Talk to you later.